Hey, hey, what is up YouTube? Andrew Rooney here, full-time drummer and drum teacher here in Auckland, New Zealand. I am very pleased to say that it is in fact Keith Moon slash The Who Week here on the channel. Now this came about completely by coincidence. I had PayPal requests for Chris Block and Eric Ballum. And both of their requests came in one after the other and they were both for Keith Moon. And I thought this is a sign we need to address uh, a shortcoming in my knowledge and probably a shortcoming on the channel in general that is a bit of a lack of the who keith moon content now what have we had so far five minutes later we have had the who the real me which was recent and we also had my generation which i think got blocked and i did a weird thing on the video where i left my reaction in but i took out the audio some people didn't like that but anyway we're going to get to some more keith moon now I thought, unusually for me, one way to approach this is to try and, I guess, get a bit of an education before I dig into the week. And I'm going to do that using Wikipedia. Don't believe everything you read on the internet, right? I still want you guys to comment. I still want you guys to educate me in the comment section. But I'm going to try and do a little bit of background research before I dig into the week. This is a different way of approaching it for me. I typically like to go on completely cold and not be distracted or have my opinion swayed by what other people say or what pe commonly gets said about a drummer. This time I'm going to do a little bit of research. Keith Moon, such a, a huge name, such an iconic name in rock drumming. All right, here we go. Keith Moon, Keith John Moon, born 23rd of August, 1946. Died 7th of September, which is my birthday, by the way. 1978. What? He was 32 years old. Keith Moon was an English drummer for the rock band The Who. He was noted for his unique style of playing and his eccentric, often self-destructive behavior. Moon grew up in Wembley and took up the drums during the early 1960s. So he joined the band in 1964? So he's only playing a few years. Wow. After playing with a local band, The Beachcombers, he joined The Who in 1964 before they recorded their first single. Moon was recognized for his drumming style, which emphasized tom-toms, crash cymbals, and drum fills. Throughout his tenure with The Who, his drum kit steadily grew in size, and along with Ginger Baker, he has been credited as one of the earliest rock drummers to regularly employ double bass drums in his setup. Moon occasionally collaborated with other musicians and later appeared in films, but considered playing in The Who his primary occupation and remained a member of the band until his death. In addition to his talent as a drummer, Moon developed a reputation for smashing his kit on stage and destroying hotel rooms on tour. Was he the first guy to smash drum kits? He was fascinated with blowing up toilets with cherry bombs or dynamite. Dynamite, sheepers, and destroying television sets. Moon also enjoyed touring and socializing and became bored and restless when The Who were inactive. His 21st birthday party in Flint, Michigan, has been cited as a notorious example of decadent behavior by rock bands. Moon suffered a number of setbacks during the 1970s, most notably the accidental death of Chauffeur, Neil Boland and the breakdown of his marriage. He suffered from alcoholism and acquired a reputation for decadence and dark humor. His nickname was Moon the Loon. While touring with The Who on several occasions, he passed out on stage and was hospitalized. By the time of their final tour with him in 1976, and particularly during production of The Kids Are Alright and Who Are We, the drummer's deterioration was evident. Moon moved back to London in 1978, dying that September from an overdose of heminevirin, a drug intended to treat or prevent symptoms of alcohol withdrawal. This is a bit sad actually, isn't it? Moon's drumming continues to be praised by critics and musicians. He was posthumously inducted into the Modern Drummer Hall of Fame in 1982 becoming the second rock drummer to be chosen. Wow. In 2011, he was voted the second greatest drummer in history by Rolling Stone's Reader Poll. Moon was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1990 as a member of The Who. 
early life. So maybe we'll see what makes this guy tick. Keith John Moon was born to Alfred Charles Kathleen Winifred Moon on 23rd of August 1946 at Central Middlesex Hospital in Northwest London. He grew up in Wembley. Moon was hyperactive as a boy with a restless imagination and a particular fondness for music and the goon show. Moon attended Alberton Secondary Modern School after failing his 11 plus exam, which precluded his attending a grammar school. His art teacher said in a report, retarded artistically, idiotic in other aspects. His music teacher wrote that Moon had great ability, but must guard against a tendency to show off. That is a very British thing to say, and I mean showing off, rock star. Moon joined the local Sea Cadet Corps band at the age of 12 on Bugle. He found the instrument too difficult to learn and decided to take up drums instead. He was interested in practical jokes and home science kits with a particular fondness for explosions. On his way home from school, Moon would often go to Makari's music studio on Ealing Road to practice on the drums there, learning his basic skills on the instrument. He left school around Easter 1961, age 14. Moon then enrolled at Harrow Technical College. This led to a job as a radio repairman, enabling him to buy his first drum kit. All right, let's get into Korea. Early years. Moon took lessons from one of the loudest contemporary drummers, screaming lords such as Carlo Little at 10 shillings per lesson. His early style was jazz influenced American surf music and rhythm and blues, exemplified by noted Los Angeles studio drummer Hal Blaine. His favorite musicians were jazz artists, particularly Gene Krupa, whose flamboyant style he subsequently copied. He also admired Elvis Presley's original drummer DJ Fontana, The Shadows' original drummer Tony Meehan, and The Pretty Things' Viv Prince. Moon also enjoyed singing with a particular interest in Motown. Moon idolized the Beach Boys. Roger Daltrey later said that given the opportunity, Moon would have left to play for the California band even at the peak of The Who's fame. Wow. Well, Hal Blaine, his idol, obviously played drums on, I believe, all of the Beach Boy stuff, or most of it. During the time, Moon joined his first serious band, The Escorts, replacing his best friend, Jerry Evans. In December 1962, he joined The Beachcombers, a semi-professional London cover band playing hits by groups such as The Shadows. During his time in the group, Moon incorporated theatrical tricks into his act, including shooting the group's lead singer with a starter pistol. The Beachcombers all had day jobs. Moon, who worked in the sales department at British Gypsum, had the keenest interest in turning professional. In April 1964, age 17, he auditioned for The Who, age 17, as a replacement for Doug Sandham. The Beachcombers continued as a local cover band after his departure. All right, let's talk about The Who. A commonly cited story of how Moon joined The Who is that he appeared at a show shortly after Sandham's departure, where a session drummer was used. Dressed in ginger clothes and with his hair dyed ginger, future bandmate Pete Townsend later described him as a ginger vision, he claimed to his would-be bandmates that he could play better. He played in the set's second half, nearly demolishing the drum kit in the process. As Moon later recounted, they said go ahead and I got behind this other guy's drums and did one song, Roadrunner. I had several drinks to get me courage up and when I got on stage I went on the drums, broke the bass drum pedal and two skins and got off. I figured that was it. I was scared to death. Afterwards I was sitting at the bar and Pete came over and he said, you come here. I said mild as you please. Yes, yes. And Roger who was the spokesman then said, what are you doing next Monday? I said, I need to do this in the accent, right? I don't know how these guys talk but I said, nothing. I was working during the day selling plaster. He said, you'll have to give up work. There's this gig on Monday. If you want to come, we'll pick you up in the van. I said, right. And that was it. Moon later claimed that he was never formally invited to join The Who permanently. He said he had just been filling in for the last 15 years. That's brilliant. That is a good quote. Moon's arrival in The Who changed the dynamics of the group. 
Sandon had generally been the peacemaker as Daltrey and Townsend feuded between themselves. But because of Moon's temperament, the group now had four members frequently in contact. We used to fight regularly in it, remembered Moon in later years. John Entwistle and I used to have fights. It wasn't very serious. It was more of an emotional spur of the moment thing. Moon also clashed with Dodger and Townsend. We really have absolutely nothing in common apart from the music, he said in a later interview. I'm not going to be able to keep that up. Although Townsend described him as a completely different person to anyone I've ever met. The pair had a rapport in the early years and enjoyed practical jokes and improvised comedy. Moon's drumming style affected the band's musical structure. Although Entwistle initially found Moon's lack of conventional timekeeping problematic, it created an original sound. There you go. That's it. Lack of conventional timekeeping creating an original sound. There you go. Moon was particularly fond of touring since it was his only chance to regularly socialize with his bandmates and was generally restless and bored when not playing live. This later carried over to other aspects of his life as he acted them out as if his life were one long tour. These antics earned him the nickname Moon the Loon. Here's a quote from Keith Moon. I suppose as a drummer I'm adequate. I've got no real aspirations to be a great drummer. I just want to play the drums for The Who and that's it. That was in 1970. Musical contributions. Moon's style of drumming was considered unique by his bandmates although they sometimes found his unconventional playing frustrating. Entwistle noted that he tended to play faster or slower according to his mood. He wouldn't play across his kit, he later added. He'd play zigzag. That's why he had two sets of tom-toms. He'd move his arms forward like a skier. Daltrey said that Moon just instinctively put drum fills in places that other people would never have thought of putting them. And this is the stuff that makes... Moon, interesting, isn't it? Who biographer John Atkins wrote that the group's early test sessions for Pi Records in 1964 show that they seem to have understood just how important was Moon's contribution. Contemporary critics questioned his ability to keep time, with biographer Tony Fletcher suggesting that the timing on Tommy was all over the place. Who producer John Astley said, you didn't think he was keeping time, but he was. In the opinion of Atkins, early recordings of Moon's drumming sound tinny and disorganized. It was not until the recording of Who's Next with Glenn Johns, No Nonsense Production Techniques, and the need to keep time to a synthesizer track that Moon began developing more discipline in the studio. Fletch considers the drumming on this album to be the best of Moon's career. Wow. Unlike contemporary rock drummers such as Ginger Baker and John Bonham, Moon hated drum solos and refused to play them in concert. At a Madison Square Garden show during the Who's 1974 tour, Townsend and Entwistle decided to spontaneously stop playing during Wasp Man to listen to Moon's drum solo. Moon continued briefly and then shouted, and then stopped shouting, drum solos are boring. And on 23rd of June 1977, he made a guest appearance at a Led Zeppelin concert in Los Angeles. Moon also aspired to sing lead vocals on some songs. While the other three members handled most of the onstage vocals, Moon would attempt to sing backup, particularly on I Can't Explain. He provided humorous commentary during song announcements, although sound engineer Bob Pridden preferred to mute his vocal mic on the mixing desk whenever possible. Moon's knack for making his bandmates laugh around the microphone led them to banish him from the studio when vocals were being recorded. This guy's just chaos. This led to a game in which Moon would sneak in to join the singing. At the end of Happy Jack, Townsend can be heard saying, I saw ya to Moon as he tries to sneak into the studio. The drummer's interest in surf music and his desire to sing led to his performing lead vocals on several early tracks, including Bucket Tea and Barbara Ann, and high backing vocals on other songs such as Pictures of Lily. His performance on Bellboy saw him abandon serious vocal performances to sing in character, which gave him, in Fletcher's words, full license to live up to his reputation as a lecherous drunk. 
It was exactly the kind of performance The Who needed from him to bring them down to earth. Moon composed I Need You, the instrumental Cobwebs and Strange, the single B-Sides in the City, and Girl's Eyes, Dogs Part 2, Tommy's Holiday Camp, and Wasp Man. Moon also co-composed The Ox, an instrumental from their debut album, My Generation, with Townsend, Entwistle, and keyboardist Nicky Hopkins. The setting for Tommy's Holiday Camp was credited to Moon. The song was primarily written by Townsend, and although there is a misconception that Moon sings on it, the album version is Townsend's demo. The drummer produced the violin solo on Baba, Baba O'Reilly, Moon sat in on congas with East of Eden at London's Lyceum Ballroom and afterwards suggested to violinist Dave Arbus that he play on the track. All right, let's get into equipment. Moon played a four and later a five-piece drum kit during his early career. During much of 1964 and 1965, his setups consisted of Ludwig drums and Zildjian cymbals. He began to endorse Premier Drums in late 1965 and remained a loyal customer of the company. His first Premier kit was in red sparkle and featured two high toms. In 1966, Moon moved to an even larger kit, but without the customary hi-hat. No hi-hats! Well, then you've got Phil Rudd from ACDC with no ride cymbal, but with hi-hats. Interesting. His new larger configuration was notable for the presence of two bass drums. He, along with Ginger Baker, has been credited as one of the early pioneers of double bass drumming in rock. There you go. This kit was not used at the Who's performance at the 1967 Monterey Pop Festival. From 1967 to 1969, Moon used the Pictures of Lily drum kit, named for its artwork which had two 22-inch bass drums two 16-inch floor toms and three mounted toms. In recognition of his loyalty to the company, Premier reissued the kit in 2006 as the Spirit of Lily. By 1970, Moon had begun to use timbales, gongs and timpani, and these were included in a setup for the rest of his career. In 1973, Premier's marketing manager, Eddie Haynes, began consulting Moon about specific requirements. At one point, Moon asked Premier to make a white kit with gold-plated fittings. When Haynes said that it would be prohibitively expensive, Moon replied, Dear boy, do exactly as you feel it should be, but that's the way I want it. The kit was eventually fitted with copper fittings and later given to a young Zach Starkey. Alright, destroying instruments and other stunts. At an early show at the Railway Tavern in Harrow, Townsend smashed his guitar after accidentally breaking it. When the audience demanded he do it again, Moon kicked over his drum kit. Subsequent live sets culminated in what the band later described as auto-destructive art, in which band members, particularly Moon and Townsend, elaborately destroyed their equipment. Moon developed a habit of kicking over his drums, claiming that he did so in exasperation at an audience's indifference. Townsend later said a set of skins is about $300. And after every show, he'd just go bang, 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 kick the whole thing over. In May 1966, Moon discovered that the Beach Boys' Bruce Johnston was visiting London. After the pair socialising for a few days, Moon and Entwistle brought Johnston to the set of Ready, Steady, Go, which made them late for a show with The Who that evening. During the finale of My Generation, an altercation broke out on stage between Moon and Townsend, which was reported on the front page of the New Musical Express the following week. Moon and Entwistle left The Who for a week, with Moon hoping to join the Animals or the Nashville Teens, but they changed their minds and returned. On The Who's early US package tour at the RKO 58th Street Theatre in New York in March and April 1967, Moon performed two or three shows a day, kicking over his drum kit after each show. Later that year, during their appearance on the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, he bribed a stagehand to load gunpowder into one of his bass drums. The stagehand used about 10 times the standard amount. During the finale of My Generation, he set off the charge. 
The intensity of the explosion sing, singed Townsend's hair and embedded a piece of symbol in Moon's arm. Ouch! A clip of the incident became the opening scene for the film The Kids Are Alright. Although Moon was known for kicking over his drum kit, Haynes claimed that it was done carefully and the kit really needed repairs. However, stands and foot pedals were frequently replaced. The drummer would go through through them like a knife through butter. Wow. All right, destructive behavior. Moon led a very destructive lifestyle. During the Who's early days, he began taking amphetamines. And an enemy interview said his favorite food was French blues. He spent his share of the band's income quickly and was a regular at London clubs such as the Speak Easy where manager Roy Flynn recalls having to throw him out on three occasions. One of those guys. And the bag of nails. The combination of pills and alcohol escalated into alcoholism and drug addiction later in life. There's a quote from Moon. We went through the same stage as everybody goes through. The bloody drug corridor, he later reflected. Drinking suited the group a lot better. According to Townsend, Moon began destroying hotel rooms when The Who stayed at the Berlin Hilton on tour in late 1966. In addition to hotel rooms, Moon destroyed friends' homes and even his own, including throwing furniture from upper story windows. Andrew, Neil and Matthew Kent estimated that his destruction of hotel toilets and plumbing cost as much as £300,000 or $500,000. These acts, often fueled by drugs and alcohol, were Moon's way of demonstrating his eccentricity and he enjoyed shocking the public with them. Longtime friend and personal assistant Dougal Butler observed, he was trying to make people laugh and be Mr. Funny. He wanted people to love him and enjoy him, but he would go so far. Like a train ride, you couldn't stop. In a limousine on the way to the airport, Moon insisted they return to their hotel saying, I forgot something at the hotel. He ran back to the room, grabbed the television and threw it out the window into the swimming pool. He then jumped back into the limo saying, I nearly forgot. Fletcher argues that the Who's lengthy break from December 71 to August 72, between the end of their 71 Who's Next Tour and the beginning of the Quadrophenia sessions, devastated Moon's health. As without the rigors of lengthy shows and regular touring, that had previously kept him in shape, his hard partying lifestyle took a greater toll on his body. He did not keep a drum kit or practice at Tara and began to deteriorate physically as a result of his lifestyle. Around the same time, he became a severe alcoholic, starting the day with drinks and changing from the lovable boozer, presented himself as a boorish drunk. David Putnam recalled, the drinking went from being a joke to being a problem. On that'll be the day, it was social drinking. By the time Stardust came around, it was hard drinking. There are other articles here, exploding toilets, uh, holiday inn incident, passing out on stage, financial problems. This is sad. And I'm going to end this video with legacy. Moon's drumming has been praised by critics. Author Nick Trelawski described him as the greatest drummer in rock, adding that he was to the drums what Jimi Hendrix was to the guitar. Holly George Warren, editor and author of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the first 25 years said, with the death of Keith Moon in 1978, rock arguably lost its single greatest drummer. According to all music critic Bruce Edda, Moon with his manic lunatic side and his life of excessive drinking, partying and other indulgences probably represented the youthful, zany side of rock and roll, as well as its self-destructive side, better than anyone else on the planet. The new book of rock lists ranked Moon number one on its list of 50 greatest rock and roll drummers. And he was ranked number two on the 2011 Rolling Stone Best Drummers of All Time Reader's Poll. In 2016, the same magazine ranked him number two in their list of the 100 greatest drummers of all time behind John Bonham. Adam Budofsky, editor of Drummer Magazine, said that Moon's performances on the Who's Next on Who's Next and Quadrophenia represent a perfect balance of technique and passion. And there's been no drummer who's touched his unique slant on rock and rhythm since. Several rock drummers, including Neil Peart, 
have cited Moon as an influence. The Jam paid homage to Moon on the second single from their third album, Down in the Tube Station at Midnight. The B side of the single is a Who cover, So Sad About Us, and the back cover of the record has a photo of Moon's face. The Jam's single was released about a month after Moon's death. Animal, one of Jim Henson's Muppet characters, may have been based on Keith Moon due to the similar hair, eyebrows, personality and drumming style. Jazz drummer Alvin Jones praised Moon's work during Undertura as an integral as integral to the song's effect. Wow, that's big. Ray Davies notably lauded Moon's drumming during a speech for the Kinks induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1990, saying Keith Moon changed the sound of drumming. God bless his beautiful heart, Ozzy Osbourne told Sounds a month after the drummer's death. People will be talking about Keith Moon till they die, man. Someone somewhere will say, remember Keith Moon. Who will remember Joe Bloggs who got killed in a car crash? No one. He's dead. So what? He didn't do anything to talk of. Ouch. Clem Burke of Blondie has said, early on, all I cared about was Keith Moon and The Who. When I was about 11 or 12, my favorite part of drum lessons was the last 10 minutes when I get to sit at the drum set and play along to my favorite record. I'd bring in my generation. At the end of the song, the drums go nuts. My generation was a turning point for me because before that, it was all Charlie Watts and Ringo type of thing. In 1998, Tony Fletcher published a biography of Moon, Dear Boy, The Life of Keith Moon, in the United Kingdom. The phrase, Dear Boy, became a catchphrase of Moon's when influenced by Kit Lambert, he began affecting a pompous English accent. In 2000, the book was released in the US as Moon, The Life and Death of a Rock Legend. Q Magazine called the book horrific and terrific reading, and record collector said it was one of Rock's great biographies. Gotta read that. In 2008, English Heritage declined an application for Moon to be awarded a blue plaque. Speaking to The Guardian, Christopher Fraling said they decided that bad behaviour and overdosing on various substances wasn't a sufficient qualification. The UK's Heritage Foundation disagreed with the decision presenting a plaque, which was unveiled on the 9th of March 2009. Daltrey, Townsend, Robin Gibb and Moon's mother, Kit, were present at the ceremony. All right, that just about wraps up this, I guess, fairly exhaustive and hopefully not too boring for you guys introduction for me to Keith Moon um, I've learned a lot just from reading that it puts things in a lot of perspective and probably answers a lot of questions although leaves a few I'm still unsure about some of the mental health aspects that are at play here and how much of this is showmanship and hyperactivity versus you know really deep-seated issues and problems um, yeah but I guess we're going to learn as we go and as we carry on during this who keith moon week i am so excited to get into this guys i will see you tomorrow with the first reaction the first video to kick off the week until then take care ciao